as our practice is every once in a while, or probably more often than not, uh, take your hand and put it over your heart uh, this morning. And, uh, you know, this we're celebrating our Independence Day. We normally do this when we pledge allegiance, but uh, that's not what we're doing right now. But we're, we're just uh, feeling our heart. I hope you can feel your heartbeat. If you can't, you're in trouble. Uh, okay. And as you feel your heartbeat, just lift your um, heart, your, the real you, up to the Lord. Father, we, we do thank you. We know in essence there's none good, no, not one. It's you. And as I said, we really, God, you have a purpose, and you're going you're gonna to fulfill that purpose whether we follow you and join you in, or not. But you desire for us to join you, to get the blessing, to be committed to you. And so I, I pray that as the men came forward, they, they really mean that, that they want to take up a stand for you. They want to, to live for you. Lord, we do need men today. When we think about our own church. We know that our ladies are so mobilized and doing all kinds of things. And our men are doing a few. But I, I pray, the Lord, that today as we think about your coming again, you'll speak to our hearts, especially the men here, but for every one of us. That we'll listen to what you have to say. Take everything out of our minds and our hearts that will prevent us from hearing your word today. I pray in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. The second coming of Jesus Christ. We're coming down to the end of uh, what, what has been known as uh, Jesus' Olivet Discourse. If you remember, as, as we continue to examine this, this discourse, this conversation that King Jesus had with his disciples regarding... The end of the world, the end times, and we come here to his actual description of the second coming of Jesus. He's already in this discourse talked about, um, he's revealed the horrors of the great tribulation, the extreme difficulty that will um, be presented to those who dwell on the earth during the time of what's known as the great tribulation. But immediately following that, the Bible says that Jesus will return in power and glory. And of course, Mark's was the first gospel, and it's the, more, mo, it's the most uh, abbreviated to the point. In the other gospels, there's a little bit more information. But Jesus doesn't provide uh, that many details, but he does tell us that he's coming back. And even though this event is shrouded in somewhat of a mystery, in the book of the Revelation, John, the beloved apostle, records much uh, for our benefit. And yet, I would hasten to say that we lack the ability to fully uh, comprehend all that will transpire during uh, that time. Many... Uh, hold a what is known as a pre-tribulation doctrine that that teaches that the church will be raptured taken out of this world prior to that great tribulation there are others who and we won't get into all all these kinds of discussions there's others who hold what is called a mid-tribulation doctrine that teaches that the 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 rapture of the church will happen uh, midway through the the tribulation i'm not here to uh, to to really uh, discuss that so much this morning but but the point is that each of these believe the Lord will return for the church in the clouds, as Paul mentions in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13, 13 through 18. And he won't actually physically uh, return to earth. It says we're going to meet the Lord in the air. So in essence, that's not really the second coming of Jesus. Um, that's him taking... Uh, those who've died in Christ and those who are alive out at that time. The second coming that Jesus is referring to in these verses deals with the literal, uh, physical return of Jesus Christ to this earth when he will establish his kingdom and he will rule and he will reign on this earth as for a thousand years, a millennium. 
So Jesus spoke of his second coming in these verses that I read here, not the, the, uh, the rapture of the carrying away of his people. And we find here that he speaks again of what I want to call the abundance of deception. He talks about deception. This culture of deception that will be present during the tribulation. He, he offers a warning, if you notice there in verse 21. He says, at that time there's going to be many who will claim to be Christ, the Messiah. He already mentioned this, if you remember back up in five, verses 5 and 6. And many have made this claim throughout history. And we know that even here in America in the last... <laughs> little bit of time there's actually been someone that's claimed to be Christ to be the Messiah and these deceptive claims Jesus said will continue until he himself returns to this earth and establishes his kingdom and he not only talks about a warning here not to be deceived but he talks about the wonders he said the false prophets and those uh, that are empowered by the Antichrist will have uh, some kind of unusual power to perform uh, miracles and signs and wonders and, and this will be appealing to so many to follow the Antichrist and he says they're going to be able to do this even to the point that maybe even some of those who have trusted in Christ might be deceived by it. That's what he says here back in verses 5 and 6. And so we cannot imagine or comprehend the power that Satan and those who follow him will possess and, re and be revealed during this time. Those who are, who are not saved by grace and settled in their faith. He said they, they, they could all possibly be taken by deception. So he gives a warning. And then he talks about these wonders. And then he speaks of wisdom in verse 23. Look at what he says. But take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. You see, Jesus challenged the disciples and all who would follow him by faith to be wary. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, you need to be wary today of false teaching, of false prophets. We, we have enough of the, work, the scriptures to know the times and the events that will transpire. We know Jesus Christ, don't we, has already come in the flesh. Amen? That's the gospel. He, he lived a perfect life. God, fully God, fully man, born of the Virgin Mary. He didn't cease to be God. He became something he wasn't. He became a man. He was known as Jesus Christ. He is a historical figure. He's not a myth, folks, like uh, some in our culture would try to do. He was a historical person. He lived a perfect life. He bore our sins as he died on the cross outside of Jerusalem. And after three days, we know because of more than 500 witnesses and the scriptures that are written down that he rose from the dead... He defeated hell, he defeated the grave, he defeated death, and he ascended back into the Father where he's seated now at the right hand of God waiting to come, as he says here, he's going to come again on that day in power and great glory. So he came the first time, we know that. And the Bible speaks more about his second coming than his first coming. So we know if he came the first time, he's going to come again. Amen. And we are witnessing the stage being set for the Lord's return. And we must be wise in the scriptures. We must be settled in our hearts and our minds to, def to defend against the deception that will permeate our world as we approach the time of the second coming of Jesus. So here's the word today. Would someone say, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. That's Jesus' word here. Do not be deceived. Do not be led astray. And then he talks about what we might say the sequence of this devastation that he's talked about before. But in verses 24 and 25, 
uh, he says uh, that um, immediately following that great tribulation, there's going to be what he calls darkness, verse 24. Don't ask me to explain this, but, but the world will experience an ominous sign. The, the sun, he says, will be darkened and the moon will refuse to shine. Look back at Joel uh, chapter 2, verse 31, way back in the prophecies where he said the same thing. Can you imagine, imagine, can you imagine the horror that will grip humanity as these events begin uh, to come on the earth? Because Jesus said, for as long as men have lived on the earth, the sun has shone forth her, her sun. Today, <laughs> the sun rose in the east and we saw him. But on this day, it's not going to shine. There's going to be darkness. Without fail, every morning the sun has risen, bringing light and hope into the world. But in that day, the sun will be darkened and mankind will be left to ponder the reason of such a calamity. And I believe that even night will be enveloped in some kind of a menacing darkness. And without the light of the sun, the moon will have no light to reflect off of. The darkness will continue day and night. It will leave men alone in their thoughts and in their fears. There's going to be a darkness that's going to come over this earth. You know, when I was a little boy, I was afraid of the dark. I don't know about you, but I was afraid of the dark. I remember my dad coming into my bedroom when I was maybe seven, eight years old. I was crying. He said, Sammy, what, why are you so fearful? I said, Dad, I want you to leave the light on. He said, no, we're going to turn the light off because you've got to learn to sleep in the dark. On this day, folks, it's going to be an eerie darkness that's going to come over this earth. The sun is not going to shine. The moon is not going to shine. And notice the second thing he talks about, destruction. And the stars of heaven will fall and the powers of heaven will be shaken. The sun is going to become dark. That's one sign of his imminent return. And then following the darkness of the sun and the moon, the stars are going to begin to fall from the heavens, he says. In other words, God in his omnipotent power, the Lord is somehow going to shake um, the heavens and the stars will fall like you, you would shake a, a fruit tree when the, the, the fruit's ready to fall. And he, God is just going to shake the, the, star, the heavens just like he created them and he spoke them into existence. He's going to shake and the stars are going to start to fall. And no doubt some of them are going to impact the earth. And they're going to create devastation throughout the world. And for many it will be uh, too late. But the sovereign... Lord of the ages will be displaying his power before sinful men. The Lord created the universe, didn't he? And he upholds it today. It says it's upheld by his power, by the word of his power. But in that day, he will cause the heavenly bodies to fall from the skies. And he will be showing his power. And you, we cannot imagine the horror and the dismay that's going to bring on the earth. Luke talks about it in Luke 21. You're going to look there, but here's the word. Someone say, put your hope in Christ alone. Put your hope in Christ alone. Don't be deceived. Somebody say that. Put your hope in Christ alone. And then, hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's going to be the appearance of deity. Listen to what he says here. Verse 26. Then they will see. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of earth heaven. Folks, everybody is going to recognize him. Jesus will visibly return to the earth following the tribulation. 
And Matthew, who is a, a little bit longer, re records Jesus saying, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And this is going to be a, a glorious sight for those who have believed in Christ by faith, but it will strike horror in the hearts of those who have rejected his grace and his love. It says here, the nations of the earth will mourn as they see Jesus coming in the clouds. Again, there, there will be no doubt as to who this is. It says they will see him. You say, how can that be? The world's be Folks, modern technology. <laughs> you say, how, how will they see it? It's, it's going to be an event that everybody's going to see that's going to be on the earth. Every eye, the Bible says, will see him. And they will immediately recognize him as the one in Revelation chapter 7. Or chapter 1, verse 7. And this will be the time will be fulfill the words of Philippians chapter 2 when Paul says every knee will bow and every one will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. Not to be saved if they're not saved already. No, they're going to acknowledge that he is the gracious Savior, Redeemer, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he, he's here the second time not as a baby but as a judge. Notice the demonstration here. This second advent of Christ will be very different than the first. Uh, when Jesus came the first time, um, how did he come? Look at little Evie right there. That's how he came. A little humble, little baby. <laughs> but if you read the book of Revelation chapter 19, when he comes again, when Jesus Christ, the Lord, the King of kings, when he comes again, he's going to be riding on a white charger, <laughs> a white horse. It's pictured there in Revelation. Beautiful picture of Jesus coming. Matter of fact, let me just read that. We're almost done, but listen. Listen to these words. John the Revelator says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like the flame of fire. His head were, on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean followed him on white horses and now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword with which he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of almighty God and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written king of kings lord of lords he will demonstrate his power and then he's going to restore the earth, the Bible tells us. Those who believed in Jesus Christ during the tribulation will have been relentlessly persecuted, scattered, many of them killed. And as Jesus comes again, he will send forth his angels to gather every believer from every corner of the earth and he will bring them to Jerusalem and there he will reign for a thousand years, the Bible says. Their season of despair and suffering will be over as the righteous King Jesus reigns on this earth. Their faithfulness will be rewarded. What's the word here? Live expectantly. Somebody say that. Live in anticipation. Jesus is going to come again. And I will admit, these verses are difficult. All of these uh, apocalyptic uh, passages are, are difficult to, to fully grasp, but no one can fully grasp, I believe, the, the enormity that, that's revealed here. And, and it is undeniable that the world 
is destined for a time of suffering and devastation that's unmatched. But Christ came the first time and when John the Baptist saw him, he pointed and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus came as a sacrificial lamb that first time. But the book of Revelation describes him in a different way and says the second time he's going to come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Judging Satan and all those who have rejected him. And again, while I don't fully understand every aspect of the second coming, I do not live in fear of that day, and you should not either if you're a follower of Christ. I have put my faith and my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for me, and he promises to give eternal life to everyone. So I ask you as we close this service today, what about you? What about you today? Where, where do you stand today? Are, are you prepared to meet the Lord when he comes? You see, now in this life is the time to make uh, preparation. Now is the time. Come to him today in repentance and faith. If you're not saved. Watching for the Lord's return does not mean that we just sit here and look up in the sky. It means looking around and showing God's love to those who need him today. Anticipating, being, being ready for his soon coming. The Bible says he who has this hope in himself purifies himself even as he is pure. We need a sense of urgency today. We need that sense of anticipation to, so that we will have boldness. To speak to those that we need to speak to, to those that are lost, to those that are far away from God. We need courage, we need boldness to help us keep a light touch on the things of this world, folks. Don't hold all that you got like this. Because, <laughs> folks, it's not going to last. Come to Jesus like this, with open hearts and open hands.